Hi guys, welcome to Nutrition for Pregnancy, Lactation, and Infancy. So we're going to be running through, um, this is Unit 2, Module 1, um, some of the requirements for pregnant women, and also lactation meaning breastfeeding, because that's basically the perfect food for the newborn, and then infancy. Now, this may not be you know a topic that you're going to need immediately but when you get to maternal infant section which is going to be in the fall of this year you will definitely be glad that you paid attention and learned about this um so you know it's it's really good i know like it doesn't seem like it would be important you know in terms of the immediate but it will be important later okay We have six objectives for this module. Uh, the first one is to identify the nutritional needs during pregnancy and lactation or breastfeeding. Uh, we are going to discuss the recommended weight gain during pregnancy. Um, and that's also listed in your book, um, the nutrition book by the uh, Institute of Medicine. Those are, you know, kind of like the governing body to, you know to make recommendations uh, we're going to discuss dietary practices to avoid during pregnancy because that is going to be very important in terms of you know the development of the fetus and the baby <clears throat> um, because there's some critical growth um, patterns that are going to be occurring and um, not only do we want to make sure that they get the nutrients that they need um, because of the greater demand, we also want to make sure that um, they're getting enough. Um, so there, it's kind of like we want to, want, to, want to give them enough but not too much because obesity, again, can also cause issues. So we'll discuss all that. Um, also discussing the dietary needs of the infant, so, you know, after birth, and really we're going to probably focus a lot on breastfeeding, uh, the advantages of breastfeeding, but also what is, you know, what what happens with people when they have to use formula. You know, of course, we want to encourage breastfeeding as much as possible, but then, um, you know, what are the kind of like comparing and contrasting the difference between breastfeeding and and formula and then finally talking about nutrient dense uh nutrition and i also want to you know we also want to talk about you know adolescent teen pregnancies because not only do they have you know the stress of the extreme high growth period of just themselves now they've got an added stress of nutritional need for the for the baby they're carrying so it's like a double double requirement that's really uh, a lot of need that's placed on the body in terms of nutrition and so we'll we'll cover all those the pregnant woman has a an added greater nutritional need during this period of intense growth for the developing baby um, or fetus and um, it's more so than any other time during the life cycle um, so pregnancy and infancy again the other one that I want to talk about is adolescence because that's also a, you know a huge demand on on um, growth but this one in particular is very important um, we want to have optimal nutrition for the mother but also for the um, the health of the baby. So um, it's going to play a critical role in the um, outcome of the pregnancy in terms of, you know, making sure the baby's healthy. And so a lot of women during this time are very focused on what, what they're doing with their body and because they want to make sure, you know, it's, you know, you've got this small window of time of nine months that you really want to make sure that it could mean a lifetime for someone your child your offspring so that's why it's so important to 
you know, get the proper nutrients and to really push that uh, bit of education on the pregnant woman so that she understands what exactly the um, manifestations are going to be for lifetime of her child. During pregnancy, there are two uh, ways of looking at what's required. It's the uh, saying, you are what you eat. But in addition to that, we are what our mothers ate because there are several nutrient requirements that are going to um, either help or hinder in terms of whether or not the, the growing child is going to receive all of the necessary nutrients. So, um, for example, I think we've talked several times already about folic acid and uh, that's that's very clear in terms of the requirements of folic acid during pregnancy. I, I think I mentioned to you that uh, folate is actually um, prescribed, or folic acid actually, which is the uh, synthetic version of <coughs> folate. Folate's in the natural <coughs> um, sense, and folic acid is the synthetic. But that is actually proven to um, prevent neural tube defects. One of the biggest ones is spina bifida, which is you know exposure of the spinal column because of the um, inability of closure for the spinal uh, nerves. And so that <clears throat> spina bifida actually has the exposure of the, of the nerves, um, which is, can cause a lot of significant problems for the for the child uh, and some of them don't survive depending on where it actually um, manifests itself on the developing spinal column so those are neural tube defects that's what they mean by that uh, related to a deficiency in folic acid other things that can ca be caused by lack of by malnutrition of the mother would be, um, well, just simply termination of the pregnancy, which is mortality of the child uh, during the, somewhere in the, in the pregnancy, um, smaller growth, growth patterns, uh, underdeveloped uh, babies at birth, and mental retardation is another significant finding in terms of what could occur. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of times you'll find malnutrition in mothers when there is drug abuse, uh, especially illegal drugs, also smoking and certain medications that they take or use of alcohol. And so it, these kind of situations kind of go hand in hand with malnutrition. And unfortunately, it does take a toll on the developing fetus. And we're, we're going to actually talk about um, the alcohol syndrome babies and go into that in a little more detail here. The final topic I want to talk about is the uh, issue with maternal obesity. And there actually is a very close link between maternal obesity and the health adverse health outcomes for the mother and child. So I think there is there's actually an obesity epidemic and this is through uh, the uh, I'm, I'm looking at a manuscript from just recently from 2014. So uh, but it talks about the ob obesity epidemic going on in the United States. Uh, and it has dramatically increased over the last 40 years. Obesity is actually, obesity in mothers or um, pregnant, pregnant mothers 
uh, after pregnancy um, continues to influence the infant's weight gain and weight status. So in other words, um, if weight gain continues to increase in, in infants and ha uh, will, uh, it will actually affect their um, risk of obesity later, which is really going to be not so good for them in terms of their overall um, just how they do physically and psychosocial wise. Uh, having childhood obesity is really going to set them up for some difficulty. So what they've done, like for example, this article that I'm looking at, um, they look at the mother's pre-pregnancy weight status and then what their weight gain is during the gestational uh, time period and then uh, postpartum, which is the time after pregnancy and then how that plays a part on the mother and the child. So um, it's really important that um, it's looked at through the, in terms of weight gain through the Institute of Medic Medicine guidelines. And we're gonna look at those guidelines here in a minute and review them. When a couple wants to become pregnant, it's important that they consider nutrition even before they conceive. And this is really the best way according to current recommendations, mainly because of the addition of certain types of nutrients that we've discussed in the past. And mainly, again, guys, the addition of folic acid, right? Because folic acid can um, <clears throat> reduce the chances of neural tube defects. And the neural tube is actually um, developed during those critical weeks um, before the mother even knows she's pregnant. Um, there, you know, the um, the baby's laying down that structure for the the nerves, and uh, that's very very early in pregnancy. So that's why. Physicians recommend getting additional doses of folic acid as soon as possible and preferably one month before conception. The other things to look at during that time are the elimination of drugs, smoking, and alcohol because any of those can cause damaging effects. Um, when we discuss um, the developing, developing fetus in maternal infant child uh, course in the fall, we're gonna be talking about teratogens. A teratogen is anything that can cause a birth defect in utero. And uh, that's why it's so important to eliminate those items that I just listed. Um, to prevent any kind of birth defects or uh, problems with the developing fetus. And um, in addition, during early, well, and throughout, uh, nutrition is gonna be really important for the mother, the, the, pregnant, the pregnant woman. Mainly these uh, additions should be considered the addition of protein. Now, I want to tell you that table 19.8, which is located in chapter 19 in your uh, Cooper and Gosnell Foundations book, um, and that's page 541, it does list some of the pregnancy requirements for the dietary reference intake during pregnancy. So, for example, protein. Normally, an adult woman would need between 46 to 50 grams of protein per day. During pregnancy, she needs 60 grams of protein. And the amounts are even higher with lactation. Make sure you look at the food sources as well uh, when it comes to, for example, protein sources. Um, another one is the iron 
because look at the amount of iron when you go down um, to you know the fourth category normally we only need 18 milligrams per day for the dietary reference intake it goes up to 27 milligrams per day for a pregnant woman and that's because of the increasing amounts of the circulating blood volume when we get to mica which is the maternal infant course in the fall you're really going to understand like how important how much of the volume of blood supply the mother actually you know produces there's so much extra circulating blood volume in the mother and that's a very that's normal that's a normal occurrence during pregnancy and so um that's why so much additional iron is needed so protein iron and those kind of go hand in hand because you know a lot of the iron that we receive do come from the same sources that we can get from protein uh, for example liver meats eggs for example those are good iron sources and these other ones that are are more um, fruit and vegetable derived so take a look at those so remember those protein the other thing is calcium calcium is um, really necessary for fetal skeletal formation tooth bud formation um, increased maternal calcium met metabolism and so those are um, definitely ones that we need a lot of the other thing is the um, down here under vitamins again the folic acid so for non-pregnant women they need four, 400 micrograms uh, for pregnancy we need 600 micrograms and I think typically they order like 400 micrograms per day just so that women are are getting that uh, basic level but you know and so that you're getting some from your diet as well um, so those are your main ones vitamin C is also a good one to look at and then just look out at the um, food sources because it tells you for all of those like for example the folic acid the vitamin C where you get those from um, and so I would just you know look at those on this chart here um, it's important to also avoid extra fat remember I was telling you just a bit ago on the slide previously that the um, we have an epidemic in terms of um, mother like maternal obesity and that also sets up risk for the the baby as well and so um, as much as we can avoid and eliminate the additional added fat uh, intake it's going to actually help the newborn as well um, because gestational weight gain which is during pregnancy is associated has associated risk for both the mother and the infant so um, in like I said in 2014 there was approximately two-thirds of US pregnancies that were exceeding weight you know the recommended weight gain for um, laid out by the Institute of Med Medicine guidelines and um, it's it's a problem I think one of the things they're looking at too is this generational cycle of overweight and obesity almost like it it carries on to the next generation and so we're trying to look at um, you know stopping that cycle of obesity you know and so that it doesn't carry on to for example childhood obesity like I was mentioning before and then also remember that fat soluble vitamins are ones that you don't need to have additional ones because they're they can be absorbed in the fat tissue so that you know we wouldn't need to um, increase those amounts so avoiding extra fat and the addition of the fat soluble vitamins like we talked about in our vitamin section I wanted to also talk about some myths and also some foods to avoid during pregnancy um, 
High intakes of mercury during pregnancy can lead to brain and neurological damage to the growing child. And of course, this can also lead to um, mental retardation in the child and uh, because of the secondary to the neurological damage. So it's important that the expectant mother eat low amounts of fish. Uh, and that's a little bit of a misnomer because you want to make sure that it's certain types of fish that she avoids because actually fish can be really good for people uh, in general in terms of you know the cardiovascular benefits antioxidant remember we talked about that in the other lecture so um, and you know foods like salmon can be great um, beneficial effects on the brain development is particularly um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, the omega-3, um, and also some of the other essential, essential nutrients such as uh, sel selenium and vitamins E and D. Okay, so those are ones found in fish in particular. Okay, so um, you can consume low mercury seafoods, such as wild caught, caught salmon, I just mentioned salmon, tuna, shrimp, pollock, catfish, and cod. And you can do it, you know, like weekly, really. And um, you wanna avoid the high mercury fish, though. That's important to tell mothers that are expectant. So swordfish, tilefish, shark, and king mackerel. Those are the ones you need to avoid. Okay, another thing I wanted to mention is you want to use coffee sparingly on the low side. I would have a hard time with that. I drink a lot of coffee. Um, but luckily that's all done. <laughs> um, other things are like um, the fatty foods. That's why I got a picture of the ground meat on there. Of course, all alcohol, drugs, and um, smoking. Make sure to tell the mother to avoid that and then eggs are on here not because of eggs in general but because of raw eggs and that's the that's the main thing on that one because the raw eggs can actually cause there's a risk for sal salmonella poisoning and so you want to make sure she tell you tell her to avoid that this is a breakdown of the components of weight gain and so remember I was telling you that the Institute of Medicine has the approximate weight gain for pregnancy, the recommendations for pregnancy. And that is in your um, Roth book, the Ruth A. Roth, Roth is the author, uh, Nutrition and Diet Therapy 12th Edition, and that's on page 173. It talks about the underweight, normal weight, and overweight, and then of course the obese mother. Um, and so it mentions the recommended weight gain because uh, it breaks down as follows. The fetus should weigh 7.5 pounds, placenta one pound, amniotic fluid two pounds, uterus two pounds, the breast is one to three pounds. Blood volume, remember I told you that's a big chunk of the weight because um, the mother is putting on a lot of extra fluids. It's amazing how much fluid she's going to be putting on which is why she's going to diarrhea so much or sweat after she delivers. And it's, it's really something she can't even control. It'll just like, I remember sheets being drenched. And I thought it was because I was up for like three nights or something, but it's because of the diarrhea, uh, diuresis factor after you deliver, you're just losing all that, that extra fluid that you had on board. So that's something, remember that when we get to the mica, because you'll need to know that. Um, so also uh, it's important to remember too, weight gain for mothers that they break it down again, like I mentioned, um, like for example, the obese mother does not need to have that extra four pounds plus of maternal fat on the bottom on the, so they eliminate that. That's why the recommended for obese or overweight is less than uh, the other classes. So if you have a body mass index of 30 or greater, you only need to gain between 11 and 20 pounds 
um, so it's just the essential not any extra because you already have it so um, but somebody that's underweight for example can gain be in between 28 and 40 pounds um, so and then a normal weight individual can gain between 25 and 35 pounds I think I was normal weight with my first and I gained 40 pounds <laughs> so you know um, I think mothers have a tendency to put more on in general which is why like I said we have this kind of like epidemic of obesity which really I think if people lean more towards the other direction they're probably going to be just fine more on the healthy eating stuff making sure you get all those nutrients in um, and nature takes care of itself there okay let's talk about caloric intake um, I just wanted to mention that it's important to tell mothers okay and remember this for Micah as well no one I'm talking about anyone I'm, a, I'm not I'm saying like if they're obese whatever should not try to lose weight or diet during pregnancy it's just not a good idea you're gonna put the baby at risk for um, nutrient def deficiencies and possibly cause some harm in the development of the growing fetus okay so it's really really important to tell mothers do not diet or you know decrease any nutrients during pregnancy okay it's too late for that you'll have to do it after and also breastfeeding can help to cause weight loss which is a great natural way to lose weight is by just breastfeeding uh, and that's after you deliver of course um, but here's the breakdown and remember I was telling you okay so here's the breakdown of the um, underweight normal weight overweight and obese okay so then they go by the body mass index right so the body mass index for somebody that's less than 18.5 um, they should get between 28 to 40 pounds recommended weight gain and then it has a break also in kilograms there um and your book also shows the recommended rate of weight gain in the second and third trimester okay so that um pounds per week for somebody underweight in the second and third trimester should be trimester should be one pound per week okay and it ranges from one to 1.3 pounds now somebody normal weight um, body mass index listed there I told you the weight gain already and then there should be approximately one pound also but um, 0 0.8 to one pound per week in the second and third trimesters okay so that's after the first there's no recommendation for weight gain for during the first trimester it's just the second and third that they really want to start putting weight on for the mother overweight individuals um, BMI listed there and the uh, total range as I mentioned um, the rate of you know pounds per week is about 0 0.6 pounds or the range is 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 so average is 0 0.6 and then the obese category um, they should be um 0 0.5 average which is between 0 0.4 and to 0 0.6 and these rates and everything i just mentioned is on that table so you know you can better understand it if you have if you're you want to pause the thing and then have this open while you're reviewing what i'm just saying and you can see what i'm talking about because it gives you the um pre-pregnancy category weight category and then it talks about that um that uh, average and then the range that I just described in the second and third trimesters and then also over here I just want to mention the caloric intake zero calories in the first trimester second trimester is 340 calories additional per day and then the third trimester is the 450 cal calories per day 
um, make sure that they're better choices. Uh, in other words, like more nutrient value. Um, you know, if they are having, for example, carbohydrates, they shouldn't be just like straight out sugar. They should be more like the grains, the, um, you know, whole grain kind of thing, which, I mean, there's a lot, you can eat stuff that is higher calorie, but they need to be better choices, uh, you know, nutrient value wise. Okay. Um, and that's basically what they mean by nutrient dense. Um, there is a description of that word in your Cooper and Gosnell book on page 540. And it, it's additional calories that should be um, foods that contain large amounts of nutrients uh, in relation to the kilocalories you consume. So even though you're getting an additional 340 from normal, those are really packed full of nutrients and that's what they're looking for because that's going to give you the greatest advantage and and most likely the least amount of weight gain because your body actually needs that is craving it and it's going to go straight for you know what it needs to do in terms of growth and development of the, of the child okay i just wanted to talk about the uh, misconception of eating for two that was really something that you know came came back I know when I was having my kids some years ago and um, you know they always like said oh you're eating for two now which really isn't true okay so it's a misconception it's a myth if you want to call it that because really a woman in her first trimester needs zero calories there's no additional calories needed in the first trimester when they get to the second trimester, as I mentioned before, there's 340 extra additional calories. And then by the third trimester, an additional 450 calories. Um, so that you wanna just incorporate an, an additional healthy snack, such as cottage cheese, fruit, you know, a whole grain bagel. Whole, bagels contain a lot of carbs, by the way. I don't know if you've ever looked at bagels, but they are really dense. And they have a lot of um, caloric value, you know, like I think they're, mm, I want to say 45 carbs per half or something like that. And then, of course, those larger ones are even more calor um, um, grams of, of uh, carbs. So they have a lot of carbs in them. So that that's going to also provide a lot of energy. Uh, hummus is always a good choice, um, and it is more you know carb based because I think it's more like a bean. I think, but you can tell it's more like a legume type um, veggie. And of course, just plain veggies are good too. <sighs> Yogurt's always a good choice. Granola actually is packed with more calories than people realize. So just, you know, like I said, nutrient dense snacks, don't go with the junk food. That's just going to rack up the calories really quickly and put weight on. So, um, and that's not what she needs. So again, you want to focus more on, um, the nutrient value needed during pregnancy. Some deviations during normal pregnancy, uh, are, there's several I'm going to talk about. And I guess if you want to think about deviations or like, problems during pregnancy with related to nutrition so that's you know the important part of this whole lecture that I'm going to talk about and I want to uh, deal with each of those in the next slides and I'll list them all so that you have kind of like an overview of what they are and then we'll um, we'll break each one down of course like we normally do there are 10 pregnancy deviations or like problems with nutrition that a pregnant woman needs to be aware of and deal with. And um, some of them are on the scale of um, either annoying or problematic all the way up to severe and could cause um, like some dangerous situations for both the health of the mother and the child and the like sustaining the pregnancy so it's important to look at all 10 of these and we're going to go through each one and talk about nursing interventions and ways to deal with each of those 
A very common problem that pregnant women have is nausea. And um, I know that for me, it was really bad. I didn't ha quite have hyperemesis gravidarum, uh, which I will talk to you guys about in more you know, detail, but I know I had it really bad and it was all the way through my first trimester. And when I had the twins, I actually had it all the way through the first trimester and then I started to, because of the pressing of the baby on my abdominal area, I had in the positioning of them and everything, I had it through all the way, as soon as the first trimester stuff subsided, the second and third trimester kicked in because of the way that the babies were positioned. So I had it all the way through with the twins. But anyway, it is very common. Uh, with pregnant ladies and um, most people get it a little bit but if it gets really bad where they're like um, throwing up almost non-stop they can't keep anything down that's known as a condition called hyperemesis gravidarum which is more serious um, and uh, some people have to be hospitalized because it gets so bad and they end up going on especially like for IV fluids um, I know one of my home health care patients actually had hyperemesis gravidarum and we ended up having to go and give her IV fluids because she wasn't keeping anything down. And so um, that was important, you know, in terms of just keeping her um, fluid intake up. Uh, and so um, I just had to go out, start an IV on her and, and give her IV fluids for that. So, um, but for most people, they have um, mild nausea uh, that they can manage. Uh, your Cooper and Gosnell book will talk about morning sickness, and I will list a couple of page numbers in here so that you guys can have a little bit more information on, on the um, effects of nausea called morning sickness um, for example there's a chart in the cooper and gosnell on page on chapter 26 and on page 765 that does mention morning sickness it occurs because there's an increase in hormonal activity and that slows the digestive system down and then enhances the um, absorption of nutrients for the baby for mild nausea the recommendation is to eat a few dry crackers before rising each morning, so just have them you know, next to the bed, and then eat frequent small low-fat meals <clears throat> during the day, and then drink a lot of liquids is the recommendation. Now, in the worst case scenario, like I mentioned before, uh, for a woman with hyperemesis gravidarum, um, there may have to be, um, well, of course, IV fluids, but then possibly for fluid replacement but then TPN is where they it's a total parental nutrition and that means that the nutrition all the nutrients all the vitamins are going through the IV so all the vitamins that are required go through an IV and when we start to talk about that when we get to the GI lecture I'll explain TPN in more detail but for the majority of women uh, they have mild morning sickness and they can get away with just having, uh, you know, the dry crackers and then just, you know, getting through the time that it takes to the first trimester, basically. Sometimes I feel like it's like a protective mechanism for, you know, the baby as well. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is another adverse reaction, and I do have the page number listed where it talks about constipation in your Cooper and Gosnell uh, fetal development and uh, maternal events during pregnancy. And um, so constipation and hemorrhoids are very common um, as well. And um, hemorrhoids are actually caused from the pressure of the baby on the um, perineal floor so that you know the baby is like pushing 
you know, down there, and so it can cause uh, hemorrhoids to, you know, the, the basically the, the larger vessels that are located around the rectum will protrude through there, and that's really what a hemorrhoid is, and they're, they can be very, you know, uncomfortable and painful. Um, now, the good news is that they do go away, so, you know, it just, just you know, they can retract, um, but it is a discomfort, uh, especially when they, when they deliver the baby, they can use these, these tucks. They're, they're just like, uh, topical, uh, pads that you place down in there that'll, um, I think it's got like witch hazel in there and it'll help to cool the area and, and help them shrink too as well. So they'll, they're just a soothing pad that women can use um, <clears throat> for hemorrhoids but during pregnancy there's you know they they're just they're kind of just there and annoying and you know sometimes laying down can also help that that predicament um, in terms of constipation constipation is um, caused primarily and that's on page uh, 769 in your Cooper and guys now but um, that's primarily caused from the decelerated digestive process as food moves through slowly through the in intestines more water is extracted and the stools become drier and harder so it's important to tell the woman to eat more foods that contain roughage such as raw fruits, vegetables, and cereals with bran, drink lots and lots of liquid, and exercise frequently. And those, those will really help. So again, uh, eight eight ounce glasses of water, um, exercise, high fiber foods, and then if they gotta go, they gotta go. They don't, they should not hold it or, you know, stop it in any way. Another word for heartburn is called pyrosis. And heartburn is described as a burning sensation in the throat. And um, some people just say it's really like awful tasting too because the gastric juices will almost like shoot up in the, um, out of the stomach area and into the throat. And there's a few, different reasons what causes it um, and some are similar to what causes the nausea or morning sickness which is the hormonal changes and then also it's because of delayed stomach emptying um, and um, again there's um, the burning sensation in the throat but also it can be caused later in the with second and third trimesters, like I was mentioning about mine. Well, that is also a reason. And um, the size of the baby, the position of the baby, where the baby's located, all cause the pushing of the stomach, you know, the, the organ itself to be pushed on. And that can cause the uh, nausea and heartburn as well. And um, so some... Now your book here, as I mentioned in chapter 26, mentions to drink milk between small frequent meals and that should help with heartburn. Um, and then it should disappear after, soon after the baby's born. Other things you can do is to avoid spicy, greasy food, avoid liquids with meals to you know, reduce the size of the meal. Wait an hour after eating to lay down and then uh, small frequent meals is another uh, recommendation. Excess of weight gain is very common during pregnancy. And as I mentioned before, it's almost an epidemic now, but it's also dangerous because the mother has a more greater, ch a greater chance of developing gestational diabetes. And gestational diabetes is a category of diabetes that is all in like in itself different from the other types of diabetes. However, they are all they are um, 
more prone to get type 2 diabetes if they remain obese. And there's also the fetal health impact and risk to the fetus. Um, and it's important that the mother understands to manage her nutrition and, um, you know, look at getting that those nutrient dense foods that I mentioned and also just to limit the amount it's you know you do get hungry you know I'll say that but it's it's better for her if she can stay within that weight range a serious medical disease that can occur in pregnant women is um, pregnancy induced hypertension but now has been updated to be called gestational hypertension. So the proper term for it is called gestational hypertension or GH. And because it was formerly known always as pregnancy induced hypertension. So gestational hypertension occurs after 20 weeks. Okay. Um, now someone that has hypertension like just, you know, they, they come in, they're pregnant and they've had hypertension, you know, before this, that's different, that's called chronic hypertension, but somebody that specifically gets it just during pregnancy, is this is known as gestational hypertension. Now, the difference between this and the life-threatening form of it, which is starts as preeclampsia and then can go up to eclampsia, is that there's protein in the urine, and those that's kind of like a distinguishing factor that happens where protein is spilled out in the lady's urine and and so when we get to maternal infant this fall coming up i will definitely you'll learn all about this okay so preeclampsia which is the you know protein spilling form of of high, you know gestational hypertension is also known as toxemia but preeclampsia can also quickly move to eclampsia, eclampsia, which is life-threatening. It's, it's deadly to the woman. The woman will die from that if it doesn't get controlled. And really the only way to control it is to deliver the baby um, because it's just going to keep going up and up and up. And so when we talk about this, you know, like later, you'll find all about it. There's no known cause for it, but definitely we need to monitor the lady for everyone that's pregnant for blood pressure and make sure that it's low and not going into the severe um, hypertensive uh, level and um, just continue to monitor. They have other signs and symptoms with that, which I'm not going to go into. I think it's too much for you guys, but just remember that it's something that you have to watch for with the blood pressure. Pike has referred to a craving of eating substances that are not normally considered edible and they're associated with nutrient deficits actually um, and they're mainly minerals of iron and zinc uh, and there's a craving due to smells that um, and also the craving to have certain textures in your mouth uh, it's typically associated with lower socioeconomic groups and um, even though the substances are not considered to be toxic there is uh, complications that can be associated with with pica such as const you know greater chance of constipation and um, they're just not getting the nutritional quality that they need during pregnancy so um, they're not, they might, there might be problems resulting from pica that would interfere with iron absorption, for example, and then um, not getting the proper nutrients that they require. So uh, really education is a key here in terms of just, you know, encouraging the person to eat the nutrients that they are missing and Hopefully they would um, stop the the chronic ingestion of non-food items. And there are things like soil, 
ice. Ice, of course, isn't going to hurt hurt you. Um, clay, starch, for example. Uh, but those other things could, uh, just because it's going to cause more, um, what's the word, um, constipation. Yeah. Another concern during pregnancy is called anemia, which is a condition marked by a deficient number of red blood cells uh, where the hemoglobin in the blood is deficient or lower. And this results in... Um, a pale color or pallor and weariness or tiredness and uh, pregnancy can cause anemia if it's existing to be worse or just induce it itself uh, and then of course there's um, deficiencies in iron okay remember I told you how much extra they need so they need extra amounts of iron and also extra amounts of folic acid and both of those can cause the anemia so it can be caused from iron iron deficiency anemia or folic acid deficiency anemia so both of those can cause it next we're going to talk about substance abuse in primarily alcohol this slide is from the american pediat american academy of pediatrics and it shows the effects of alcohol abuse. And when a child has physical abuse secondary to uh, the mother drinking alcohol, it's known as fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, that includes some physical changes that are lifelong. In other words, they're gonna stay with the child throughout their um, entire life. Uh, but with that as well, there's, uh, there's a lack of or subnormal physical and mental development of the child as well. Um, now, just physically, they have, here's some symptoms. They have a small head um, their eyes appear to be set further apart, but what's also occurring is that the eye opening, so if you look at like this little girl's eye, her opening uh, between the, um, the medial canthus and the lateral canthus, so you know like the, the width of the eye is short, so that it, it's almost like the eyes are kind of scrunched uh, more narrow, narrow set, and um, another symptom that they have is the upper lip is basically uh, thin, so you can see she barely has any upper lip, and then the um, the philtrum, which is it's supposed to that part of the the area between the nose and the lip are is supposed to indent and that's smooth and so those are some developments that don't occur you know like they it's almost like they get um, out of sync because of the use of the alcohol um, the ears are also um, malform there's a malformation of the ears and um, it can affect nervous system. Uh, they can have hyperactivity, seizures, attention deficit. And um, they can also have deficiencies in growth, such as height and weight, so that they're in the uh, low you know, growth category for normal. Now, if they don't, have like let's say the mother drinks alcohol but she doesn't abuse it to the point of developing the physical symptoms then they can also have fetal alcohol effects which is that you know maybe she did drink but she didn't abuse it and that what what's associated with fetal alcohol effects is that there's there's really no physical defects that occur but then they have the behavioral and the psychosocial problems associated with fetal alcohol syndrome so there's those are those two categories so really there isn't any safe level of 
alcohol consumption during um, during pregnancy. So it's really best to tell mothers don't drink at all, period, because it's it could cause um, all of those defects. This is just another picture I wanted to show you on the fetal alcohol syndrome. The cardinal facial signs are the thin upper lip, the smooth philtrum, which is that little dip in the, um, that's supposed to go in right underneath the nose and it's missing. And then the last one is the eye, uh, it's called the palpacral, palpacral fissure, which is basically the opening of the eye is more narrow. And you can see where it's showing you uh, the dimensions are, it's almost like the eye gets kind of scrunched together. You know, it still opens the same uh, in terms of opening, but the, the, you know, the space where the eye sets is shorter. So, um, and I can show you guys that in class too, if there's questions about that. Another abuse that a chronically can, um, occurs is the use of caffeine. And I think a lot of times people, you know, think it's okay to have that, but really for a pregnant person, you don't want to have a lot of it. So, um, the recommendation is no more than 300 milligrams per day. Um, and you have to realize that that amount is, um, about two cups of caffeine beverages per day. And it's everywhere. It's in chocolate, it's in, of course, coffee, uh, soda, it can be in medicine. Um, now, it is known to cause, high amounts are known to cause birth defects in rats. With um, humans, Studies have shown that moderate amounts of caffeine can be harmful. So it's best to just have low amounts of caffeine. And um, having said that, that should be acceptable. Smoking tobacco is the third substance abuse material I wanna to talk to you guys about because there are some pregnant women that continue to smoke and it is proven to be associated with reduce birth weight. Uh, for women that smoke, um, the baby will be smaller because it reduces the placental blood flow and then hence it will also reduce the um, the oxygen levels to the, the infant and the nutrients as well. So because anything, remember the placenta is the created blood stream if you want to say it that way to the baby and once if that decreases because of smoking smoking will cause that then you're going to have decreased oxygen and decreased nutrients to the baby so the subsequent reality will be a decreased birth weight sudden infant death syndrome um, that's what that is is where the baby will be born and you know you put them in the crib and then the next morning they could wake up dead. There's no known cause for it other than the, there's an association with uh, situations that I just mentioned, such as smoking. Um, fetal death uh, could be prior to, um, basically that what that means is prior to delivery is that the baby would be born dead. Uh, subsequent spontaneous abortions. Now, when they say spontaneous abortions, those are, they used to be called miscarriages, and that's the same as a miscarriage. It's a natural abortion, uh, but unfortunately, smoking can cause that, which it would not necessarily be wanted by the mother, um, and it would cause her to uh, abort, spontaneously abort the baby. Um, other things that have been proven are behavioral and in, in intellectual levels uh, that have been decreased and problematic. So um, it is really important to tell mothers not to smoke as well and uh, avoid using any drugs of any kind. Um, over the, even over the counter drugs need to be approved by a physician in a prenatal check 
because anything can affect the fetus and you want to make sure it's on the safe level. There are classifications of drugs that are considered safe, like for example, folic acid is considered completely safe uh, for a, a developing fetus. But you have to make sure that you check them out and you have to tell her to make sure she knows what she's taking and if it's safe for her baby. Some women develop diabetes during pregnancy. Now this does not mean that the, ba the mother will continue to have diabetes throughout her lifetime, but during the pregnancy, it means that she has developed diabetes uh, and that's known as gestational diabetes. Just like I was telling you about the hypertension with gestational hypertension, it's similar, but in this case, it's diabetes that is, has developed during, pregnant, during pregnancy and that's known as gestational diabetes. And it's only, it only occurs during the pregnancy, okay? So, um, and for whatever reason, the mother, the, you know, the stress or um, this, is put, this is putting in a strain on the mother in terms of producing enough insulin to manage the pregnancy and her own insulin requirements. Basically, diabetes is caused by a decrease in the amount of insulin available in the bloodstream. Now, our pancreas typically will respond to anything that we eat and produce insulin for us. The pancreas is responsible for producing insulin to cover elevated blood sugars in our bloodstream. And so it works as a um, feedback mechanism when there's glucose that's present in our bloodstream, insulin is produced and excreted by the pancreas to respond to the level of uh, glucose that's in our bloodstream. Once the glucose, once the glucose is present, insulin is secreted by the pancreas. Once the insulin is in the bloodstream, the insulin will um, proceed to all of our, um, all the cells in our body and basically unlock them. So there, it's sort of like a, it's, I always think of insulin sort of like a key to um, all the cells in our body. And you can think of the cells in your body of, uh, as they're like little houses and they all need food. And they're waiting for the food trucks to come, which is the glucose. Um, but without the insulin, we can't unlock those houses, which are our cells. And sometimes what occurs is that people do not either produce enough insulin or the houses themselves are not responding. And I always think of it that they got, they had their locks changed. And so you can try all the insulin you want, but it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna open that lock. That key is not gonna work anymore because the houses decided to change the lock. And that's basically your type two diabetes. With gestational diabetes, the mother um, does not have enough insulin that um, is adequate to um, to respond to the requirements of um, the the blood the blood glucose level. And studies have also shown that it could also be the um, improper use of the insulin as well. And that's known as insulin resistance. Remember I was telling you about the little houses that are your cells that don't um, respond to insulin. That's called insulin resistance, okay? And so some people believe that the placenta itself, so the placenta that the mother creates for the baby, causes the insulin resistance. And there's so much more that they're learning about all of these disorders that, you know, every day we, you know, we kind of learn a different piece of the puzzle. But so whether it's too, too little insulin or whether it's insulin resistance, 
as the cause. Um, the point is, is that they have, they don't have a proper response available uh, in the use of insulin. So glucose remains in the bloodstream. Now, because it's in the bloodstream and the bloodstream is shared with the baby, that's going to give the baby uh, hyperglycemia, and that can be deadly for the for the developing fetus. It's really something you cannot, they can't continue with. Um, so it has to be controlled. Um, most likely that they'll give them insulin injections because that's really all they can take. And they do have, um, they also attempt to do diet initially. And if that doesn't help the woman, then they have to go to insulin, as I just mentioned, in insulin injections. But many of them can be controlled with diet. So they recommend three meals and two snacks, which is approximately every two to three hours. In addition to that, it's recommended that they have no more than 45 grams of carbohydrates. So remember I was telling you earlier in this slide presentation about bagels being so high in carbs. I've always been kind of a carb watcher because of my weight and you know I've wanted to sort of like keep my weight down for that reason. And so I've looked a lot at carb, the con you know, the composition of carbs and how much. But I can tell you, you know, foods like bagels, I believe like just a half of a bagel is 45 carbs. And right there that's, you know, a person with gestational diabetes already has had their max just with a half a bagel. So, you know, this is what this is what they do um, in terms of instructing them. And I just want you to know too, diabetes, the, just, that's why they have diabetic educators because diabetes is complicated. Uh, so don't feel, you know, like, oh my gosh, I don't understand this. All you're needing to know right now is just the very bare bones basics. And it's basically the hyperglycemia in the mother. It can be deadly for the baby and that they mostly control it with diet, but sometimes they have to use insulin as well. And really just like I said, knowing the basics is all you're expected to know at this point. So the final point I wanna make about this is adolescent preg pregnancies and they do occur. Um, girls that get pregnant um, when they're still teenagers have a tremendous challenge that they have to um, take on because it affects every part of their lives. Okay, it's the nutritional, physical, psychological, social, and economic stress that occurs on all of those areas of that that girl, that young girl's life, she is still a girl herself. She's still developing herself. And now she's got a developing baby that she's having to adjust to and support. Um, and it's overwhelming. They're really not ready um, in any of those areas. And even physically, um, you know, they'll, they get, but they're growing themselves. And so the added physical demands are um, just, it's a very high growth time, growth time just for the, just for the adolescent without the baby. So in addition, you know, many families are not ready for that kind of responsibility. And so it does affect, um, affect the entire family. Um, having said that though, uh, they need a lot of support, I guess, because it's still a life and it's still, um, you know, something that they have to deal with. So I, you know, would just be very, very supportive to the, to the mother. Um, uh, and re remember too, it's a, it's a phenomenal, tremendous caloric uh, burden in terms of what they are required to do. Um, they're also more susceptible to the pregnancy induced hypertension or the gestational hypertension that I mentioned and premature, premature delivery. Um, the gestational hypertension can cause cardiovascular and kidney problems later. 
So, you know, hopefully they don't develop that, but, you know, there is a higher possibility just because they're not quite developed where they should be as a young woman. And so then to have to put that stress on their body could cause issues um, with them. And sometimes they get estranged from their families because of the pregnancy. And so then there's this, you know, there's also that, you know, they may have to move out or maybe they move in with a boyfriend or something. And then they have the, the whole financial problem as well. Um, now there is a government funded program called uh, Women, Women, Infants and Children known as WIC, W-I-C. And that helps with prenatal care, uh, any nutritional um, support and education, and then any food, like they do give um, supplemental uh, food vouchers for like, um, if they're going to use formula, for example, and uh, additional help that way. So there is that resource. Nutrient dense food is are foods that have higher amounts of nutrients as compared to the number of calories. And um, so they, in other words, they contain a larger amount of nutrients compared to the number of kilocalories that you get. And I did list some examples. Now, um, of course, dark chocolate's on there. And actually, dark chocolate does have nutrients in it, surprisingly. So for pregnant women that do, you know, are seeking, um, you know, alternatives, because of the high amount of cocoa in it, uh, cocoa is actually a very nutritious food. In, it's loaded with fiber, iron, magnesium, copper, and manganese. So um, it also has an amazing amount of antioxidants, which I think people are not necessarily, you know, aware of. Number one on the list, salmon. <laughs> That's probably the best food you can eat. I know my husband loves salmon um, and other types of fatty fish. Remember the, the list, though, I told you that they can't have. So uh, it's got omega-3s, uh, which are great for optimal functioning of the body. And um, let's see, it's got magnesium, potassium, selenium, and B vitamins. That's in salmon. Kale is second on the list. Um, I'm not a big fan of kale. I'm, I just feel like it's so bitter. Um, I don't know. But it's got 200% of the RDI of vitamin C, 300% <laughs> of the RDI of vitamin A, and 1,000% of the K1 requirement for vitamins. So it's really, it is packed with, you know, what we need. And that's only in a 100 gram portion of kale. Um, seaweed's another one. I know that's really good with sushi. And there's garlic. Uh, that's an amazing, uh, very nutritious ingredient. Um, it's high in vitamin C's, B1, B6, calcium, potassium, copper, and manganese, and selenium. So anyone, anyway, shellfish is on their potatoes. There's a, there's a whole list of, uh, as I mentioned, nutrient-dense foods that we can tell people to choose from, especially if they're pregnant. Uh, of course... Uh, foods to avoid and also especially teenagers because you know they're not gonna really they're just gonna be hungry all the time um, remember to tell them they can have a whole bagel <laughs> because they're growing so much um, but teens you want to tell them to try to avoid the fatty foods which are just gonna put extra weight on potato chips cake soda candy you know all the high caloric um, you know, kind of like high fatty foods. They're really high sugary. You know, those aren't really um, the greatest choice for them to have, especially during pregnancy. Okay, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about needs of the uh, baby and lactation and what kind of diet to have for the newborn infant. Um, I'm going to spend um, a bit of time here on talking about lactation because lactation is really the best food. It's the perfect food for the baby and uh, it's what we rec 
recommend uh, if a woman does decide to breastfeed, that is really the best choice. Um, and there really isn't a reason um, that most women, almost all women can breastfeed uh, and the size is not a barrier. They do need education uh, in terms of how to do it because I think there's a lot of, um, there's societal um, prejudice, it seems like in some ways. So um, it, you know, women need to be educated on how good it is for their children. And um, just to understand the process that um, it is, it does uh, occur with the birth of the baby and it, it is hormonally driven so that um, the oxytocin and prolactin hormones start the lactation process and um, Prolactin is the main hormone that's responsible for milk production and oxytocin causes the milk eject ejection from the breast tissue. And then um, crying actually will increase um, the, rele you know, the, the release. It's kind of like this natural um, letdown process that occurs with the release of oxytocin in, um, that causes milk letdown. Um, now, initially the mother does have um, some milk that comes in that doesn't look like the normal milk and it's called colostrum. It's more of a um, kind of a tannish color. It almost doesn't even look like milk. It's really thick, and but it's loaded with nutrients and it actually is milk. But it's, I think a lot of times people are like, well, I don't have milk. That doesn't look like normal milk. And it really doesn't look like normal milk because it is um, what they initially get. And it's just a normal thing that the body produces called colostrum, uh, but it's got like a bunch of antibiotics in it that prevent the, you know, the child from getting any infections from the mother, of course, natural. Um, and uh, also, um, I'm sorry, correction, I meant to say antibodies, not antibiotics. <laughs> um, yes, colostrum is high in um, antibodies from the mother. Excuse me on that one. So, and that is, as I mentioned, um, it is basically uh, a large number of antibodies that are secreted by the mother uh, through, that will help the infant uh, fight off disease. And so it's a natural uh, boost to their immune system. And incidentally, um, infants are covered with the mother's immune immune response. Like anything that she's had exposure to, the, the infant will have coverage in terms of exposure. And they really don't, They the good thing about that is that they have less chance of getting some of the, you know, more deadly diseases because they're getting protection from the mother for up to two years of age. But drinking the, the colostrum that has the antibodies present in them will also uh, boost that, that uh, protection for the child. Um, it also has um, an increased amount of uh, carbohydrates and it has protein in it. Um, it is lower in fat. Um, in terms of the colostrum content, you know, what's the content on the colostrum. And then um, what does happen is that the milk comes into full, um, like what you would expect the normal milk to be. Uh, and that usually takes approximately two to three weeks uh, once the feeding routine is established. And the thing with, with milk, suckling, the more the baby suckles, the more milk is produced. So in reverse of that, the less the baby suckles, the less milk is produced. And it's kind of, I always felt like it was sort of sad a little bit because, you know, it's like you're leaving this time of 
you know, the special closeness with your baby. And of course the baby is growing up, um, which is a normal, you know, part of growth and development, but it is that kind of like for the mom, you're not, you don't have this little baby anymore. It's a very short time. And so you really want to enjoy it while they're little because you're going to blink and it will be over. So during lactation, the mother still needs to focus on good nutrition and um, the absorption of nutrients such as, um, oh, for example, um, foods that are high in iron, that are cooked well, um, like they don't, they still don't want to have any, you know, like raw meat, for example. Um, they want to, you want to encourage them to have vitamin C with um, preparation of uh, foods that contain iron to help with the absorption of it. Now, those are the ones that you've learned from other chapters, but they're important to know now because they still need to have that really good nutrient um, absorption. And uh, they're, they're producing nutrition for their child for that first year. So the calories need to be there, but they need to be, again, nutrient dense calories. As I mentioned before, breast milk also provides that temporary immunity to other uh, diseases through the mother. Uh, and again, like I told you, like the colostrum has the antibodies present. Calorie wise, mother should ingest 500 calories for the six for the first six months of the baby's life. After that, it's 400 plus calories and plenty of fluids. It's very important that she drink a lot uh, because she's producing a lot of, um, you know, she's providing for herself and for her baby. So she needs to have a lot of fluids to stay hydrated. Any additional requirements vary depending on the mother, the age of the mother, uh, how big her baby is and the baby's appetite and how active the mother is. So, you know, for example, if she um, is more physically active, she may require more <clears throat> fluids uh, based on how active she is and possibly more calories too because, you know, she's going to burn off more. Um, once the baby stops breastfeeding, you know, I, I was mentioning on the other sl slide that the milk will, um, they can get engorged, which means that the milk kind of stays in there and it hurts in the breast tissue. And then, but then it'll gradually go down. So the baby will drink the next time around, but then it'll produce less. The next time so it's it's sort of like this balance um for example if they sleep through a feeding then that time won't produce the milk that it did before when they were when they were nursing like a lot more um frequently so it's it's just kind of it's based on exactly what the infant needs if the, if he needs more it's going to produce more if he needs less it's going to produce less um but the baby on average requires approximately 100 kilocalories per day for the first year of life. That's a general number, so I would know that. And um, that's pretty much what, you know, it's going to be based on. Now, there is a chart in your book that looks, it shows a general feeding guideline for infants. It's table 11-1 on page 194 in the uh, nutrition book. And it just breaks down like for four to six months uh, when you want to start adding um, solid foods, for example. So the recommendations is, are that it starts at four to six months, okay? That you start with uh, solid food, right? Okay, so that's what our supplemental um, food, I guess, is another way to say it. Um, 
So they start really small. They usually start with like a rice cereal, for example. I remember doing that with my my kids. They always start with rice cereal. Maybe one tablespoon of a fruit or a veggie. And then they just do that for a while. You know, they don't really have that much. They mostly have breast milk the first four to six months. Um, and then six to eight months, they gradually increase more. So that um, at six months, then you're going to start to add um, like an egg yolk, for example. And then um, I remember, yeah, it, it lists meat, like two to three ta tablespoons of meat through the through six to eight months. And I, I remember they do get hungry. They get a little bit hungry and they're growing more too. So the breast milk isn't going to be as satisfying that it was in the beginning, in the very beginning. Um, so that you'll have to start adding a little bit more of that solid food. And that goes all the way through 12 months. Your book breaks it down six to eight months. Now, I didn't do it on my slide that way. But you can see here that like six to eight months, you know, the amount is two to three tablespoons of, of the um, meat, for example. And then um, eight to 10 months, you're getting more per meal, like you're adding meal at lunch and supper. So, you know, it just, it's gradually increasing until you get to 12, eight, 10 to 12 months. That's where you're going to have the majority of your food from the solid but then they still start with that morning uh, feeding of breast milk or formula uh, I remember most of my kids went to a cup by then um, that you could start uh, or, or bottle you could you know still but I know mine I tried some of my kids wanted a, a cup at, at around 12 months so it just depends on the kid, um, what they're doing, but a lot of parents just still use either a bottle or breastfeed uh, when they're, until they reach that 12th month, then you wanna start adding, you should not add cow's milk until 12 months. That's the recommendations, recommendation, okay? So no cow's milk until 12 months. Um, before that, they should be on formula. So again, at a year old or 12 months, you start adding cow's milk and you can start using my plate at 12 months as well, okay? Now, I wanted to mention too, the reason why they start slow like this is to prevent allergic reactions. So um, it's important that you follow the recommendations of the how they, um, slowly introduce foods because if you just like compile it all at once then the child could have a possibility of getting an allergic reaction um you know so again infant food infant food solids to infants are introduced um one at a time okay so in other words uh what i'm trying to say is you'll start with the rice, the rice cereal. See how he does with that. That works fine, no allergy, good. Then you can start, you keep the rice cereal and then you add something else. Try those two, all good, add something else. And that's how they want you to do it. Don't like bombard your baby with like 20 different new things because that is gonna, you know, if there is a, a allergy you don't know if there's a food allergy and so the main reason is that they do it one at a time to prevent any food allergies from occurring that's through the recommendations of the American um, a pediatric um, uh, people Sorry, American Academy of Pediatrics. That's the word I was, I had to look it up real quick to tell you. Okay, um, so before the mom has the baby, really, she should decide what she wants to do. Does she want to go natural? Because it's, it isn't as easy as it seems, although it is the best. Like, uh, sometimes people get 
um, like they it hurts to have the baby latch and there's an issue with the way the tongue is and so they have to have uh, like I know one of my nieces had to have uh, I think it's called a frenulectomy where they had to remove the frenulum because the tongue was sucking too hard and it was hurting her and it was actually making her cry so you know there's little issues like that now it's not a big deal to have that surgery uh, it's very minor but um, it and it did you know it does help in terms of you know having that issue resolved but um, you know you have to realize that you know it's not an easy process and a lot of mothers have no trouble with breastfeeding but some do um, the other thing is to stay hydrated you must stay hydrated you also have to still avoid you know substance use you know because that can just cross right over and any stimulants can cause ir irritability in the infant and um, excessive alcohol can cause will act like a depressant to the baby so um, there's that and let's see if there's anything else I want to tell you I would also like if you do have you know alcohol or whatever you can also pump and discard you know so that you're not passing any of those harmful substances to the baby and I know a lot of parents do that um, or mothers I should say um, other than that I think that's pretty much lactation and like I said lactation is really the way to go for the baby that's the that's the choice preferred way to tell parents this is a little thing on why it's so good for the baby um, helps with uh, the immune system you know there's a response better to vaccinations and uh, helps the child to ha have a mature immune system uh, in addition to that it fights off any um, you know infections such as you know in the urinary tract uh, it does help the bowels to move better in terms of constipation keeps them more regular um, and they also have fewer ear infections because they don't have the bottle kind of like sometimes children that fall asleep with bottles the, the um, liquid from the the bottle can actually because of the shape of their eustachian tube it can kind of drain into the ear canal from the throat area and then cause a um, setup for for ear infections and you're not going to have that with breast milk because of the way the system is it's like the perfect system for a baby uh, imagine that um, also you have less issues with any orthodontic uh, future issues with teeth because of it's a it's a perfect fit for the baby in terms of suckling and they don't have this hard rubber thing that's going to like distort the shape of their teeth and um, again I can't stress enough the immunity response you know in terms of the urinary tract the ears the throat um, just fighting off all kinds of infections they have less of a chance of getting any allergic eczema for example than um, mothers that bottle feed because there's really no allergy to be thought of that they have, react to so um, it does help with visual acuity in the eyes it's been known to give them higher IQ with um, the support of the growth of the nerve tissue and it helps in terms of joints and muscle growth uh, they're less likely to get any uh, like for example the juvenile rheumatoid arthritis it's an autoimmune disorder in children but they are less likely to get that being breastfed um, and then just uh, there's less of a risk proven less risk to develop diabetes based on breastfeeding so wow all that <laughs> it's a win-win I you know the other thing I was going to mention the reason too it's a win-win is because the mother will actually help it'll help her lose weight and so that a lot of moms love that because you know they want to get rid of that extra 
you know, pregnancy weight, and so all they have to really do is breastfeed, drink a lot of water, you know, keep up everything, and, um, you know, they don't have to prepare anything, they don't have to go run, heat a bottle up or something, they can just, you know, kind of just lay down with their infant, and it, they're feeding them, so it's pretty easy. Sometimes it is um, necessary to bottle feed. I know both of my sons had to be bottle fed at a very young age. It just wasn't, there wasn't latching going on and I don't know, it just wasn't working for me. Um, I think they just didn't like it. I'm not sure why. So um, I did, but my daughters, you know, did fine with the breastfeeding, but I guess my point is, is that it's, you know, it's really, you know, individualistic in terms of the child. And, you know, it's just a matter of um, not, don't put yourself on a guilt trip or, you know, feel that, oh, the, the patient's, you know, not doing the best thing. Sometimes they just can't, you know, and I, I know I tried, um, you know, with one of my sons, I tried for a while and it just wasn't, in fact, I, I felt like he was almost heading toward dropping a little bit in his weight and it was concerning me and um, just was flat out refusing to take the breast. And I think it's because the bottle, he realized that the bottle is easier, you know, in terms of sucking because it is, you know, they don't have to put as much effort into when they're suckling. Um, and so he pretty much knew right off <laughs> that that's what he wanted. <laughs> So anyway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, make your patient feel bad by any means if it doesn't work out because it sometimes it just doesn't. But anyway, if they do, um, again, you know, these are some comparisons in terms of breastfeeding versus formula feeding. Um, there is an increased exposure to sugar, uh, the high GMO exposure, allergy risk, synthetic vitamins and then um, the risk for fat deficiency. Those are all things that you know they look at, but most infants just do di completely fine with, I mean, I know my two sons did perfectly fine with um, bottle feeding, and I had to start that around, I think around five months of age or something, four to five months in there. Um, so, you know, it is it is what it is. I think even if they get a few months in there or even a few weeks, it's better than nothing in terms of getting that um, value of breastfeeding. And um, so for formula feeding, um, they can have more of a chance of, like I told you, the middle ear infections because of the shape of the eustachian tubes and just the way that the bottle can tend to drain you know, because they, they have, their their station tube kind of goes, you know, like across versus like adults. Ours are, you know, like it's almost, you almost have to go up, like when you're drinking, like tip your head upside down or something to, to get it to go in an adult's a station tube. Um, whereas like for babies, because their station tube runs right across sort of like parallel to their throat and ours tends to go downward so it doesn't go up in there like a baby's would. So if that makes sense. It's just anatomy basically. So anyway, um, that's another disadvantage to formula feeding. Um, although it is a little bit easier in terms of like it's you can get the ready-made stuff and all you have to do is pour it in a bottle and heat it up and you're done. You have to shake it first and then you just give it to them. It's really simple. Although you can get the powdered stuff and that you just put in there, you make these bottles up, you have to shake it and you know, that's, that's not that hard. Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, you just do what you gotta do, I guess. Um, it is really important that you follow the manufacturer directions in terms of giving formula though, because you don't want to like cheat the baby with the amount of nutrients they are getting. That would be bad. So you have to make sure you give them the proper amount that's on the label and mix it appropriately. Um, and again, you do not give them cow's milk until they're one year of age. 
and that's mainly because of the protein content and um, it's difficult and more slower to digest cow's milk than human milk so it can cause uh, a GI issue and potentially blood loss in the gastrointestinal tract so really important not to give them that until they're a year old before that they have to have formula or uh, breast milk okay so they can drink formula all they want but you can't give them the cow's milk until they're one year of age okay um, let me see what else I think that's pretty much it Oh, I did want to mention the, um, you see here on the, the right column, all the additional benefits of breast milk. So obviously, <laughs> um, I made my point, enzymes, growth factors, antiparasites, antiallergies, antiviruses, hormones, and antibodies. So one other thing I wanted to mention was the um, societal concerns about breastfeeding in public. I think um, I know that, you know, it's, it's difficult having an infant to, you know, you want to go do things and go out with your husband and go enjoy like a dinner and go shopping, you know, out on the weekend and that kind of thing. But it is difficult when you have to feed your baby and you're still breastfeeding. And I think people kind of look down on it. They think it's sick. They, you know, there's all kinds of name calling that goes on or whatever. And I think it just is a matter of realizing that this is something that's not new by any means. And, you know, it's, it's been around since the beginning of humanity. So it's just a matter of working out a, you know, some kind of a um, system that works for you. Um, I know with me, I would go into, you know, a bathroom where they have, sometimes I have to go into the, the uh, toilet area and just sit with my baby because there wasn't any other place to go. But I think some restaurant or some um, department stores do have like a little lounge area with a, you know, like a chair or a couch or something and you can relax in there. But you know, if they're hungry, you can't, you can also, you can also go to the car or you can, um, you know, you can pump two ahead of time. But remember that if you don't get them to suckle, they're going to produce less milk next time too. So there's that. So it's just sort of like this balancing act all the time of trying to provide for them, but yet not, you know, be exposing yourself in public and stuff like that. So um, there are there are options, and I think workplace even are they're getting better with providing places for women, especially since it's I think women are demanding that they have that option available to them and uh, which is a good thing for the baby because it is so good for the infant that first year of life. So lots of choices. So here's the object objectives that we just went over. Uh, the uh, nutritional needs during pregnancy and lactation, recommended weight gain during pregnancy, the dietary practices to avoid during pregnancy and lactation, and some problems that we discussed um, we also discussed the dietary needs of the infant, advantages of breastfeeding, and then uh, defining nutrient-dense type foods. So as always, bring your questions to class, and I look forward to uh, reviewing this stuff with you and doing some activities.